This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. much for having me here today. I'm excited to talk to you about this intervention that uh, I just spent the last two years of my life working on. Um, it was a really exciting intervention. We got to actually go into a high school and implement this intervention, this, this package of interventions, uh, social skills interventions, with students with high school, with general education teachers, with special education teachers like Tony Camalucci, um, with school psychologists, with parents professionals, with students, with families, um, and with other peers at the school. So I'm excited to come here and talk to you about this intervention. It's a doable intervention. It's, a, it's, a, it's an economical intervention, and um, I'm excited to tell you about it. Um, here's our overview for the day. Uh, I'm going to tell you, first of all, briefly just a little bit about CESA, what this project was all about, how it got started. Um, the National Professional Development Center was the sort of, it was born out of the National Professional Development Center, so I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, and also the resources that are readily, uh, easily, and free, freely available to anyone on the internet about evidence-based practices, including the peer-mediated interventions that we're going to talk about today. Um, talk a little bit then, give you some background on social competence and why it's so important in high school. Uh, then we'll get into the actual social interventions. I'll define what peer supports are, what peer networks are, and what the SCIH, Social Competence Intervention for High Schoolers program is all about. Then we're going to get into the meat, the steps for implementing peer-mediated interventions. And at the end, I'm going to have Tony Camalucci, who is a incredibly experienced uh, special educator um, at like 15 years experience, Tony, is that? <laughs> You lost count. Um, he's going to come up here. We're going to talk about what we actually did in the high school over the last two years and the experience that he has uh, from his perspective. Learning objectives. So at the end of this program, I hope you'll be able to describe the unique social skills challenges that high school students with autism experience, understand the evidence base of social skills intervention, and what's available out there in terms of finding out information about EBPs for high school students with the ASD. Um, I hope you'll be able to identify the potential benefits and challenges of establishing this type of intervention in a high school setting, and the process, actually how you do it in a high school setting. So, CESA. CESA, like I said, was, uh, stands for the Center on Secondary Education for High School Students with Autism. It was born out of a five-year project called the National Professional Development Center. The NPDC, which Sally was a, a principal investigator on, was a, a multidisciplinary, multi-site study with University of North Carolina and University of Wisconsin, where we uh, reviewed the literature, determined what evidence-based practices were effective um, and appropriate for students with autism across the age range, so from preschool, elementary school, middle school, and high school. Um, then the NPDC uh, put together uh, learning modules, learning briefs, um, teaching people how to actually implement these evidence-based practices for these different age groups. Uh, uh, in a um, in an efficacious way, in a way that is appropriate to the fidelity of the uh, the EBP. So, out of that project, what we found is that there the the services for high school students um, are incredibly lacking. So we have. 
really great um, interventions for preschool students. We have great interventions for elementary. And as kids age out um, or, or age, um, the services become much less available. Um, and certainly the evidence for those services become much less available. Um, these statistics are pretty disturbing. Um, nearly 80% of, of adults with ASD who, who leave the public school system still live at home. Almost half have no jobs or post-secondary training. 40% never have contact with friends. 17% uh, never feel hopeful about the future. 21% never engage in outside activities. And many experience a decrease in insurance coverage and therapy services. So that's where CESA comes in. We want to do something about this. CESA's job is to develop and evaluate a comprehensive intervention program for students with ASD, for high school students with ASD. So what we, took, what we did is we took what we learned from the NBC, NPDC, we took all those evidence-based practices, and we, um, and we determined specific interventions in these four areas that we want to um, develop as a package for students across the country. So academic interventions, specifically in reading comprehension. Um, we have looked at independence and behavioral interventions. The social skills intervention is what our site was focused on in the last two-year pilot. And then transition and family interventions. So what we're going to focus on today is the intervention that we, uh, that we did here in California. And that was focused on social skills. But first, let's talk about social competence. Social competence, as you know, encompasses a broad set of skills, social communication skills, social cognitive skills, relationships, determining what type of relationships. There are lots of different types of relationships out there. Um, and then, of course, the context in secondary settings is quite unique. There are many high school students um, experience many different communication partners across the day, much more than, say, a child in elementary school. Um, High school has a culture. There are groups in high school, as we all may re recall from our days. And, uh, and high school students with autism have a very difficult time navigating within those groups and understanding those groups. Um, relationships in high school become much more complex and nuanced. And, uh, and it's important for us to work with these kids and help them navigate, help them understand those different types of relationships. Social communication skills are expressive communication, comprehension, and pragmatics. Are there uh, any speech therapists in the audience, or am I the only one in the room? Oh, good, there's one. So pragmatics, as you know, is what to say, how to say it, who to say it to, and when to say it. Um, and of course, that, in, that encompasses both nonverbal communications as well as verbal communications. Um, and so social communication skills go into social competence, and it's an important skill for our kids with ASD to learn. Social cognitive skills are things like theory of mind, so understanding how to see things from another person's perspective. Relationships. Kids in high school with ASD want to form relationships uh, just like kids without ASD. They want boyfriends. They want girlfriends. They want best friends, BFFs. Um, you know, they they want to have social relationships with their teachers and other parents and coaches. They want all that, just like uh, kids with uh, without ASD. They just don't know how to get it, and that's what we're trying to teach them. And then finally, behavioral, uh, behavioral issues go into social competence as well. Um, and what we have found in our peer interventions is that by working with peers and kids with ASD, we actually are able to address some of the behavioral inappropriateness that comes up in a much more effective way than, say, if a teacher would talk to the student individually. So let's talk about the social interventions. That, uh, that we did this last year. We have peer supports, peer networks, and an intervention called Social Communication Intervention for High Schoolers. Um, we completed these interventions in one high school. We had eight students who participated in the program uh, with autism, um, and then we had 
uh, probably, I mean, over 20 peers that participated in the program. Um, what we did is we had our peers, um, our peer students uh, commit for a semester at a time, because obviously things change, classes change, schedules change, and so we had our peers commit to like a semester at a time where they would participate in the program. But what we found is that 90%, 95% of our peers just kept going. They didn't quit the program ever. They just wanted to keep going. They had, you know, they really enjoyed being a part of it. Um, so that's why we had at least 20 peers, probably more. We also had five core school staff who were, who were who are pivotal in being uh, in making this intervention work. We had Mr. Camalucci over there, who's our special education teacher. We had his paraprofessional. We had three school psychologists who all had different caseloads um, across uh, different caseloads in the school. Um, and then we also had a speech language pathologist who also came on board towards the end of the of the last semester that we were doing it. So we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of school staff really involved in our project. Um, um, and then we're also going to talk a little bit later about how we got administrators and general educators to become involved in our project as well. Um, okay, and then those are the three interventions that we did. Talk a little bit, starting with peer supports. So peer supports are basically taking a peer who's trained in some of the strategies that we train them in, and we uh, pair them with a student with autism in a classroom setting, usually a general education classroom setting, although we have been in uh, self-contained classrooms as well, um, or resource classrooms. Um, so we take at least one or two usually peers and we have them work with, sit next to, interact with students with ASD in their classroom that they're both sharing. It really focuses on communication, on social skills, and on academic skills, participation in class. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, some strategies that we use are modeling. So we teach the peer how to model appropriate appropriate question asking, when to raise your hand, how to ask questions and interact with other peers in the room, um, and then prompting. We teach the peer how to maybe prompt the student with ASD to, um, you know, to not ask a question while the teacher's talking, but to wait until the teacher stops talking before they blurt out their question or raise their hand before they ask their question. Just little reminders and things like that. We have the, uh, for, when coming from the peer, it's much less in intrusive for the student with autism than, you know, than coming from an adult. Um, the context is in a, you know, in a classroom. We work on academic, we work on social skills. Uh, Eric Carter, who developed our particular brand of peer support and peer network interventions um, from Vanderbilt, he has published several papers on this showing efficacy in, in the elementary age group and middle age and in uh, middle age, <laughs> middle school and in high school. Um, most of his evidence, too, interestingly, is with students with severe disabilities too, so it, it's a really powerful intervention. Um, we implemented in mostly core academic classes, but we also, we actually had a wide range. We implemented this in, say, an art class where kids are milling around and there's not a lot of structure in the classroom necessarily. Kids are sort of working at their own pace. We had peer supports for our students with ASD in that type of a setting. And then we also had peer supports in, um, in a very, uh, you know, much more structured history classroom and math classroom where perhaps the opportunities for social interactions are lower than say in an art classroom because the teacher's lecturing, it's much more structured. Um, but the the, the power of those social interactions are very strong. So, you know, when we started, and this is with one student in particular, this one student that we started with, you would walk into the, he would walk into the classroom, he might say hi to his teacher, and then he would sit down, pull out his phone, pull out his book, or just stare into space. And that's all he did. And I don't know if you've been in a high school classroom anytime recently, but usually before the teacher starts lecturing, it's chaos, it's cacophony. It's these students are in there, they're walking around, they're yelling across the room to each other. It's very social, it's, you know, there's a lot going on. And this student with ASD wasn't able to engage in any of that typical behavior. We started peer supports for this student, and within 
the first session, he was engaging with his peer during that social time before the teachers start lecturing. Um, he would, they would have a conversation about what they did in the last period, or they would have a conversation about what they did at lunch, or what they're gonna do this weekend, and it was incredibly natural looking. And that increase in social exchanges was immediate, and all it took was proximity and training the peer to just be aware, to just ask questions, to be engaging. That's all it took, was very simple instruction to the peer, very simple training to the peer, and then proximity, just getting them introduced to each other and engaged with each other. Um, the social initiations made by our target students were also increased outside of the classroom as well. So at the end of class, when you also have that chaotic cacophony, um, when the students are leaving the classroom, you also get lots of social opportunities then as well. And so the students and uh, the peers would walk out of the classroom together and talk about where they're going to go next or what, how they're going to get the homework done or they're so you know, anxious about the tests that they have the next day or something like that. Um, what we did that I think was really successful was we had the target students uh, with ASD and their peers attend weekly meetings, and I'm gonna show you some of those uh, meetings, what they look like. Um, what we did is we did, that was an opportunity for us as facilitators to do a lot of modeling for the peers. So then the peers could learn from us how to interact with the student with ASD and understand more about what the student with ASD was trying to communicate when they were having difficulty communicating. Um, and so, so the next, uh, I'm gonna show you a video now of one of our first peer meetings and um, and you'll see in this meeting some of the specific simple skills and strategies that we teach our peers how to do. The first one is simply responding, oops, simply responding to the student with ASD. You know, a lot of our students with ASD, they, uh, they might say something, but it won't necessarily be a directed to a person. So a lot of times when they, when students with ASD comment, it gets ignored. It doesn't get reinforced at all because they don't, quite understand how to use those nonverbal skills to get someone's attention. Skills like eye contact or using gestures or even a, um, you know, some kind of a greeting like, excuse me, or hey, did you hear about? Our students with ASD don't necessarily always do that. And so a lot of times their voices are ignored. And so what we do is we teach our peers to clue in, to start listening more carefully to our students with ASD. They want to say something to us. So let's be sure to listen and let's be sure to respond. And so what you see in this first clip is, is them doing just that. They want like sketch out a big basketball. Oh, Oh, that's purple. Uh, that's purple. I like the buddy that Alphorn is. Oh, yeah, that's funny. I love it. It's going to dry out. It's going to dry It would have been cool. Like, it would have been good. It's like a Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, Kara, I believe I have met your, uh, your sister. You met Lisa? Yes. Oh, that's cool. How did you meet her? Uh, one of the one of the football games. Oh. Yeah. Tell me, my brother. I say just like randomly, kind of scattered. Can you use a brown? Brown? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Looks like Chinese, like, looks like a Chinese chick. So as you can see, it, it doesn't necessarily look very structured, does it? <laughs> it looks like kids in a classroom making posters for the basketball game, and that's exactly how it's supposed to look. What's going on, the training that's going on, isn't necessarily direct training. Um, what we're doing, I said earlier, as facilitators, is we're walking around, and we're prompting, and we're modeling, and we're maybe doing some explanation. Like if, you know, if the student with ASD, for example, uh, you know, if the peers hadn't responded when our first student had said a comment under his, uh, you know, to himself, um, we might say, hey, did you, did you hear what he just said? I think he said something about, you know, whatever they were looking at on the wall. Um, so that's a way that we can kind of intervene, train the peers without, you know, being too directive or, you know, intrusive about it. Let's talk about peer networks. So peer supports are interventions that happen in a classroom. Peer networks are interventions that happen outside the classroom. Um, so peer networks can be anything from going to lunch together, going to a basketball game together, um, you know, walking down the hallway together, um, anything like that. It really focuses on communication and social skills and social connections and engagement. Uh, we use strategies like modeling and prompting. We also do some more direct uh, peer student training. Um, and, uh, and that happens in like our weekly meetings. Um, like I said, lunches, clubs, basketball games, any, any place where peers and students can get together and do something together, that could be considered a network. Uh, we have evidence for this in elementary and middle and high school and with students with severe disabilities. So our implementation, uh, we had lunch meetings weekly and I think that was a big part of our success to have that consistent weekly time and place so that everyone can get together and we did a variety of activities you know anywhere from uh, just normal kind of conversation eating lunch together very casual non-structured to making posters to different sort of uh, like role play exercises where the kids and we're going to show you a little bit about that later um, let's see what else we played lots of games it was very fun it was just really fun very casual all the kids had a great time uh, we saw increased interactions from all of our target students that were involved even the target students that didn't want to be involved <laughs> we saw increases in social interactions we had one student in particular who was uh, if you asked him directly you know to come to a meeting or something he would outright refuse but if you just said hey we're having lunch why don't you come you know why don't you join us it was like okay sure and within two minutes of him sitting in the classroom with us just hanging out, he would be talking, engaging, um, responding to his peers. So it was just, with him, it was just really about being about casual and indirect and, uh, and much more casual. Um, but he responded very positively to the peer interactions that we had set up for him. Um, we had, uh, you know, other things that we saw was participation in other school activities, typical high school school activities like rallies, like proms, like basketball games. These, th these are things that our kids with ASD didn't participate in before we started this intervention. So that was really fun to see. Um, we also had specific groups that uh, came about at, you know, through this intervention. We had one club that was started with one of our students with ASD, an anime club that I'm gonna show you some video of in a minute. Um, and that was, you know, that was a group that sort of, that was a network that was sort of created through the course of the intervention. We had another network that started uh, from an, a group that was already going. We had one of our students who was totally into Dungeons and Dragons, and he had um, uh, he had this, I think, four times a week or five times a week, he would go in the library and he had this group of people that he ran a Dungeons and Dragons game with, 
Um, so D&D, he was totally into it. So what we did is we had some of our peers go and join him in the library. Boom, peer network. Um, so, and it was very exciting. It was really fun to watch. I mean, we started out with one network at the beginning of our project. I don't know how many we had at the end. We had kids going to lunch together, all these games and, you know, school activities together. Um, so it was, it was pretty fun to watch. So uh, the video I'm gonna show you now is of our anime club. This is at the beginning of the year. Like I said, this was a student that um, wanted to start kind of a network after being involved in our project for a little while. He wanted to start his own anime club. So he and Coach Cam got together. They went to the administration. They asked for permission to start this club. Um, this student uh, puts together agendas every time the club meets. He um, organizes posters uh, to let people know when the club's going to be. He has an email list that he sends out notices for everyone to come. And he's had support in doing this. He's had support from teachers at the school and from his parents. Um, but for the most part, he's really taken this on himself. Uh, and um, and it's, been, it's been very successful and very fun to watch. Just so in case some of you aren't here, during, during non-meeting weeks on Fridays, we watch anime. And, and remember, remember to try and find any others. And so I would encourage you to join. Yeah. So does anybody have any ideas about what, we, what, we should do, what else we should do during the meetings? Any suggestions? I, I kind of just thought I'd want uh, everyone, can you everyone listen? One second. So, did, it, did everyone get my email from yeah. last night? I didn't get, I didn't get your email from last night. Did you write down the email because it said yeah. my name? Yeah. Somebody else's name, somebody else's name. Like yes, I, yes, I did. I put, I put my personal email down. Yes. So, who would be next to... Who would like to volunteer for the upcoming Sorry, poster or poster yeah, setup? Kind of you know, set posters around the school. Um, what kind of things do you want me to draw? Like, I can draw from your from bleach or. You can draw an animal for. I'm not very good at drawing animals. What, whichever you, uh, you think would be the best or you're most comfortable with, whatever you want. Like not to just as much email. I can print some pictures out for that if I want to. I'm a good drawer. Nor, nor me. Okay, so on the next meeting, we will do our own vid um, video game competition. So some of the things that you saw in there was um, some uh, some practice. I mean, the student was able to get some practice leading the group, um, organizing people in different ways. Um, it was also very cool. I remember specifically on this day being very proud of this student because uh, I got to see this very cool interaction at the at the end as they were walking out. Um, he complimented the guy who was going to draw the pictures. He was like, I really like the way you draw. And the kid was responding with, oh, thank you. I mean, it was just such a beautiful, natural interaction. It was just gorgeous to see. Um, and not something that, hap that was happening before this club started. So it was a, it was a whole new world. So next, we're gonna, I'm going to briefly, briefly talk to you about social competence intervention in high school. So we had these peer-mediated interventions going on. We also had this very structured social skills program that we implemented. Um, and the reason why I'm going to just talk to you briefly about it is because it's a, a system that it's a program that's not commercially available yet. Um, so, you know, there's not a lot of resources out there for it. But what we did see is the kids who 
participated in this social competence intervention, this directed social skills group, social skills class, as well as the peer interventions, those kids tended to make more progress and uh, more quickly on the self-identified goals that they had. So I, I could see some connection with the two, uh, with the two interventions working together. Um, this intervention is really focused on social cognition, so directed social skills training. Um, it has five units which are scaffolded, embedded within each other. Um, one of the great strategies that I think high school students uh, responded so well to with this program is video modeling, which is also an evidence-based practice. Um, and so this program, uh, Janine Steeser from the University of Missouri uh, created, developed, and is, um, is further developing and researching this SEIH. Um, and so their team, they got clips from normal TV shows like Glee and like, um, uh, what's the one with? Uh, modern Family, <laughs> Modern Family, and so whenever Sofia Vergara was on the television, we were watching clips of her. It was it was a good thing. Um, the kids loved it. They laughed. It was really fun. They responded really well to looking at social inter interactions and analyzing them. But you know from a TV show, and that was fun. Um, our so the social skills groups in this intervention are a minimal of four students, max of, of six students. It's teacher-led. It's a highly scripted program that you follow. Um, we have emerging evidence for middle school students with ASD. Uh, Janine actually created, uh, developed the SCI for high school just for the CESA project. So that's why it's brand new. There's not a ton of evidence behind it yet. Uh, we had in, at our site five students. We met two to three times weekly during classroom, uh, during class time. And what was nice having it during the day is that it became like just a regular class. Um, where are you going? I'm going to social class or whatever. Um, it wasn't like meeting before school or after school where it's like you're getting, I don't know, it's, it's sort of this extra thing you have to do. This was embedded throughout their day, which I think was nice. On the flip side, what was difficult about that was getting all the kids scheduled at the same time where we could pull them out of the classroom, and of course getting the general education teachers on board, getting them to agree to have the kids out of the classroom for this time. Um, it was challenging, but we were able to do it. It was successful, and the kids all benefit from it. Uh, let's see. One thing that we thought of might do better uh, with this is to make it, I mean, we thought of it like a class, we treated it like a class, but the kids didn't necessarily get credit for it like a class. So that would be a really good incentive to embed in further projects if we use this program, is to get the kids some kind of a credit so that it would be a little bit more legit. Um, when selecting peers, you want to find peers that exhibit good social skills, strong language skills, and good attendance. And the good attendance is probably, you know, self-evident, especially with our peer supports, where there's only maybe one or two peers in the classroom that are assigned to one student with ASD. You don't want the student to be, uh, the peer to be absent all the time because that's going to really, you know, that takes away from the intervention that's going on. So you want, you know, fairly good attendance. Um, you also, uh, for peer supports, the kids need to have similar schedules or academic groupings as the students. So kids who are the same age, um, it's, you know, it would be awkward to pair, for example, especially in peer supports, a freshman with a senior and, or whatever. You want to make sure the kids have, you know, the same kind of academic grouping. Um, you want kids for peer networks, if possible, it's ideal to have the kids share similar interests. So I mentioned the student with ASD who ran the D&D &D game at lunchtime. Well, we happen to have one student in particular in our peer, who volunteered to be a peer, who was also really into D&D. &D. And so it was like a perfect match to have this peer go in and work with the student with ASD in that setting. Um, but a lot of our peers, they don't necessarily uh, share the same interests. Um, and that's OK, too. It's all right. And there are some things that are sort of neutral, like going to lunch or something like that. Who doesn't have an interest in lunch, you know? Um, and of course we want our peers to have a willingness, express a willingness to participate, and all of them 
definitely did. This was the matrix, matrix that we used to select interventions for our students with ASD. So we have our intervention approach in the middle, peer networks, peer supports, and uh, SCIH. And then we have the students' needs over here on the left, and of course the resources um, and context of the school over on the right. So for our peer network, we want the kid, we want the child to do well academically, but maybe need support to join a peer group. Um, we, uh, the student is in a more social environment at times, so we want the student to have access to like a lunch or a club or things like that, and that's a perfect place for a peer network. Um, for peer networks, we need staff to facilitate meetings. That's one thing that you need. Um, you obviously need enthusiastic peers to engage the student in those meetings. Um, and you need to have a space. You need to have a space and a time weekly where you can get together and meet. We found that to be really important. Um, you know, another thing that goes into peer networks actually is communication. Um, how are you going to communicate to students who, um, uh, you know, when and where to meet and the, you know, if meeting times change or yada, yada, yada. And so uh, Tony found this great resource called Remind 101. Is that right? Remind 101, and it's, it's, you basically set up a class online, a group on this program, and then he could send out text messages to all the students, but uh, to their phones, but he would have their numbers, but they couldn't text back. So in other words, everybody's privacy is secured, um, but he could still communicate, send out a mass email. Uh, and that was really, that was key. That was really pivotal to our success, I think. Communication is always tough. Uh, for peer supports, uh, this would be for a student who needs access to more academic and social activities in the classroom. Um, obviously, we need to find the right classroom and the right teacher to participate. Uh, you need a peer who wants to be, uh, you know, have that kind of interaction um, and wants to participate. Uh, and what we did is we found it really awkward for the adult to actually prompt and facilitate in the classroom. I think that might be more feasible in other types of classrooms, but we were in a lot of core academic classrooms. And it's just really awkward for the adult to go up and model or prompt or something Thing like that between the peer and the student. So what we did is we used we used our our weekly meetings to do some of that facilitation and some of that follow up. Um, and when we were in the classrooms, we would mostly just observe, be there to support or answer questions if something came up and if they came to us with questions. Uh, and then finally, the SCIH group. These are for students with an IQ of over 75 and good attendance. Um, students uh, who participate in at least one general ed class um, and who want or need access to that type of instruction. Um, and we kind of already went through the, what that looks like in terms of a resource standpoint. So the next step in implementing these interventions is selecting student goals. And I think you know, what we did in high school is so different than what you would do like with a middle school or with an elementary school uh, student. We had our high school students um, develop, identify and develop their own goals. And then we helped them flesh those out, make steps for them, make, you know, appropriate guidelines for that. So we actually had students decide what they wanted to work on. And then we helped them figure out when they would work on that, so the antecedent, uh, you know, specifically what they wanted to work on, so their behavior and then figure, figured out an appropriate criteria for how to work on that. And in the NPDC and also in CISA, what we use to work on goals is called gold, Goal Attainment Scale um, with an acronym of GAS, which if you can imagine high school students using the word GAS a lot, it was, it was quite amusing. A lot of fart jokes. Um, so, they, uh, so they worked on these forms, and this is how they monitored their progress. Um, and we would, look at these, we would look at these progress on a, on a regular basis. Um, some students, especially those who were participating in the SCIH group, we looked at their goals every time we met. Um, other students who maybe were just in peer networks or peer networks and peer supports, we would look at the goals a little bit less frequently. Um, but we all, but we did consistently talk to them about them. So this is one student's uh, GAS form. 
So what she wanted to work on is she had a YouTube channel, and she really wanted uh, to for people at school to follow her on her YouTube channel, and to um, and so that she could get to know them. And so what we did is where her baseline went, which is the the zero scale, the present level of performance. She had the YouTube channel, but she had no one at school that followed her on it. So then what we want to get her to is this blue area, which is her annual goal. It's not necessarily an annual goal if you think about it, you know, uh, strictly, it's more like, okay, when we're going to start, which was in this case around uh, October, and when we're ending, which in this case was around May, we sort of looked at it in, in that time range. So where she wanted to go was she wanted to get at least five or six new peers to join her on her YouTube channel by the end of the school year. Um, then we went back and we built in her objectives for that. So her first step was during the peer network meetings that we had weekly, she would um, approach with maybe some facilitator support and prompting and modeling, she would approach a peer and invite like one to two peers to um, join her YouTube channel and then follow up with them. Um, and this was by about December, a few months in. A few months later we wanted her to get like three or four unfamiliar peers and be able to invite them and get her get them to follow her on her YouTube channel so that she could talk to them about it at school. She met her annual goal by probably about, uh, let's see, I, I think it was probably about um, March or April she had met her annual goal. So. That's what's so great about this goal attainment scale is that it actually has an exceeds annual goal. So we were able to keep her same goal but just build on it. And that's what she did. So her exceeds annual goal was to, um, to independently invite 10 or more peers to join her YouTube channel. I'm not quite she got, I'm not sure she got up to 10 or more, but she certainly got closer and she certainly got more than six. Um, so this was a really concrete and visual way for her to monitor her own progress and for us to check in with her and, and pay attention to it. All right, so training peers. We always start with orientation. Uh, we start with introductions. We talk about the goals of the program, which was to have fun, to increase opportunities to meet new people, to help each other develop new friendships, and encourage each other to be involved in school and after school activities. Um, we also really hammer in uh, confidentiality. Uh, we uh, want to respect the rights of all the students and all the staff who are involved in this project. Uh, but of course we do talk about confidentiality too. You know, we want to make sure that it's a very respectful um, environment and that everybody respects each other. And I, we didn't have any problems with that with our peers or our students. So these are some of the strategies that we teach our peers. Um, and these are facilitation strategies to promote interactions among students. So one is, for example, modeling ways to interact. And then there are a couple of examples here that we might say, like, uh, like we would tell the peer, Jasmine would, you, Jasmine would be able to play this game if you could show her how to match her cards. So that would be, that would be a direct um, sort of prompt that we would give to the peer to help her understand not only in this case what Jasmine is thinking and what she's feeling, why she's having difficulty, but then also what that peer could do to help Jasmine in that situation. Um, and so another, another example would be if we were actually playing the game with the peer and with the student, you might say, oh, how does this work? I see. You need to match the green cards to the green cards and put the red ones together. So in that case, the facilitator is modeling what the peer could be doing, like explaining the situation in a way that's, you know, very natural sounding. Another strategy would be highlighting similarities. So the facilitator might say something like, you know, did you know you and Eric might uh, want to compare your essays? Because each of you both went to see the Avengers movie last week. Um, you guys should talk about that. Um, or wow, did you know you both like country music? Todd just went to a concert. You should go ask him about that. Um, so this is something that you could say to the peer or to the student with ASD as a way to sort of facilitate, model, and prompt some interactions. Uh, this would be an example of interpreting behaviors. So, you know, something that I think uh, comes up is that with our peers, 
they don't quite understand how to interpret some of the behaviors of maybe a student with ASD. Like, why doesn't he say goodbye to me before he just walks away, away from me down the hall? I, he must be rude or something. And what we can do as facilitators explain, no, it's not that, you know, he's not trying to be rude. It's just that, you know, he sometimes, like, forgets to say goodbye or something. Um, he doesn't know that that's a really important part of the conversation. So what you can do as a peer is, uh, is you know, maybe just kind of remind him, hey, hey, I just wanted to say goodbye to you. See you later. And just kind of stop him and prompt him to say goodbye, which will remind him to have a more appropriate social interaction. So that's a really important part of the facilitation process as staff is to interpret those behaviors behaviors in a way that makes sense. We also have what's called big ideas for peers. And uh, this, these are little things that I would maybe write on the board. Um, I wouldn't put big ideas for peers, but I would put maybe big ideas for everybody. Um, and I would write some of these little, quick little reminders or messages on the board during our weekly peer meetings. So things like ask lots of questions and find out what, e what other people enjoy, um, or uh, don't forget to, um, you know, don't forget to interact with others in the classroom, um, or things like don't forget to say goodbye to someone when you're walking away. Just these little, quick, little, big idea kind of moments um, that would help remind everybody that we are working on social skills. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.